and all that welcome will never be saved for posterity. Um, this is a live event. Um, if you are having any technical difficulties with Adobe Connect, my colleague Zach Spaulding is here to help you. He's on the line now and he can give you assistance either via email, phone, or chat. Um, and this is a participatory webinar, so we encourage you to participate. Terry and I are both using voice over IP to connect today, and we hope that we're coming in loud and clear. If you have any sound issues, please let us know via chat. Um, we are the only two with audio enabled, so if you have something to add, please use the chat box. If you're not hearing us clearly and your speakers are set up and on properly, please let Zach know. Another way you can participate is by using the raise hand icon. Generally, we use agree for yes, disagree for no, and applause if the mood strikes you. We will do our best to keep an eye out for raised hands so that you can participate and ask questions that you might have for Terry. So let's try that now. Uh, please use the applause button to give Terry a warm welcome. You, uh, Terry, do you want to turn on your webcam and say hi? Um. Well, I have a, I have a picture on my uh, thing. I put it on my docking station, so I lost my webcam when I plugged in. So uh, I have a picture, though, so I can show you guys before I get started. <laughs> Just in case. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's fine. I will, I will hand it over to you, and I will see you guys at the end of the webinar. Okie dokie. All right. So what I'm going to do here um, is uh, the easiest way to do this is um, this that uh, everybody will be able to download. But I'm going to just share my screen since we're going to be um, doing uh, this in real time. And I see there is a hand raised. Is that uh, just for the fun of it, or is there a question? All right, let me share my screen, and if there's a question, type it in the chat. All right, here. Just monitor. All right, so you guys should all be seeing my monitor now. And now seeing the, uh, the slides. Um, so I have down here, uh, Adobe Connect makes it so that I can actually see um, when people have questions. It'll give me a little alert. So. If you do have questions, uh, please uh, let me know. All right, so I kind of uh, fudged the title a little bit when I was putting this together, uh, partly because what we ended up uh, wanting to do was after doing the workshop um, back in, I guess it was May, um, one of the, the sets of feedback that um, we got back was that uh, one of the things that a number of folks had hoped to be able to do was actually um, take the, the concepts that were being discussed and try to use them against real data. Uh, it's really hard to do in a um, in kind of a broad overview kind of a session. Um, and so what we want to do is come back around and give people an opportunity uh, to ask questions that maybe they didn't get to ask, or if they have data, uh, make it available uh, before the workshop. Um, and I would go through and, and take some opportunities to try and provide some answers uh, to how you might go about uh, finding solutions for uh, some of the problems that uh, were noted um, through using MarkEdit. Uh, one of the other things I'll be doing is since May, there's been a couple of things that have changed in the application. Some of them I think that are exciting that folks here in this group might be of interest, might, might be of interest to this group. Um, so I will uh, actually highlight um, one of those uh, specifically. Um, one of the uh, answers to the questions um, that I have, too, actually comes from new development that I did last night. Um, because I, I read the question, I thought, I, I, I do have an answer for it, but it takes a lot of steps. And I uh, figured that this would be easier um, to, uh, that, that there was actually a tool here that could be used to uh, simplify that process. So um, hopefully it will be uh, useful um, when, I, when I demonstrate how this works um, to everybody. And, and it'll show up in... Uh, the next version of Mark Edit, which will probably be sometime this weekish, because um, I need to now backport this into the Mac version um, for work that I'm doing there. All right, so uh, as promised, I have a picture. So uh, I had this feeling that um, when I uh, plugged my laptop into my docking station, that uh, I was going to lose my my live webcam feed. Um, unfortunately, I don't have. I, I hadn't realized that I didn't have a webcam on any of my monitors. Everything seems to be built in anymore, and so um, I wanted to make sure that there was a picture. This is uh, from probably I think Code for Lib this year. Uh, so it would have been in Portland. So it would have been actually not cold. I, I just wear my hat all the time in the winter. So uh, hello. All right. 
So, uh, question. So, basically, what I hope to oh, I see a question here. Basically, what I hope to get out of this um, in the uh, in the okay, just a second. You're seeing both. Oh, you're seeing another. I got two screens going on here. I see. Uh, there we go. Um, uh, let me. Uh, um, so I, I actually want the slides to be present. So hopefully this is hopefully this isn't too big of a deal. I have two two monitors, and it looks like Adobe's squishing them all together. So hopefully this is a hopefully having you're seeing enough of the the uh, uh, the slides here, so this isn't disruptive. Um, if it is, I can disable one of my monitors, and uh, and we can go forward. So if if this is a problem, if if seeing that little bit of um, edge on the right is, um, is making it difficult to see, let me know and I'll, I'll just turn one of my monitors off. Um, so anyways, so what I'm hoping um, you guys will get out of what, what, I'm, what I'm planning to do with this webinar, so what I'm hoping to do, so I'm going to demonstrate some specific aspects of the application. Uh, we got roughly 10 questions uh, over the course of the last few weeks. Um, some of them are uh, asked by the same person. I have uh, some data sets that I'm going to walk through to demonstrate how they work. Um, one of the things that, that happens in MarkEdit is that there is um, it's a slide share on the bottom. Oh, um, I don't uh, see. Okay, so um, so what I'm uh, so what I'm going to be doing is I let me see. What are you doing? Okay, great. She'll hide it. Okay. So what, uh, what I'm planning on doing is um, using real live data to try and answer questions. Um, I have a little bit of my own data. I actually did a, a session um, for the folks here in Ohio, um, a, a general session uh, where we worked with a little bit of data. So I'll, I'll bring some of that in. Um, I want to demonstrate some targeted um, applications to um, some of the new editing functionality. And I'm not sure why that says reworld. I, um, I want to demonstrate some editing techniques within MarkEdit. Um, you're going to see a lot of um, regular expressions, uh, and I'll try and walk through those as we use them, uh, because a lot of the questions, the answers tend to be regular expressions, um, and hopefully uh, provide relevant answers to the people who sent in those seed questions. Uh, but I also want to provide opportunities for folks to continue to ask questions. Um, we have a, a, a bit of time here. Um, I have. I have content to, to keep going, uh, but I think that this will be most applicable and probably most useful for the people on this call um, if you ask questions. And so um, my hope is that as we go through um, the questions that are here, um, that they will spur on other questions people might have. All right. Um, so, like I said, ask questions. Uh, that's going to be the uh, best way um, for this to go forward. Um, I definitely want to make sure that we answer everything that uh, that, that folks have come uh, with. All right, so let's get started. Um, so before I start, uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, make clear is that uh, the tool we will be working with um, regular expressions. So I've provided since not everybody um, comes to this with regular expression experience. Sorry. Um, Oops, back, back, back. Sorry, I got a little. All right, comes with this with regular expression experience. Um, I wanted to make sure that uh, you had um, some opportunities to answer to get answers to questions. Uh, Mark Edit uses the .NET regular expressions. Um, you can find the quick language reference um, to the first link that will take you to the Microsoft site. Um, and it will explain um, all of the grouping um, and algorithms that we end up using during the process. Um, there is a regular expression tutorial, which is general regular expressions, so not .NET specific, which is what MarkEdit uses, but the, a lot of the pieces that are there um, will be applicable. Um, and then there's a 30-minute regular expression tutorial, which is really useful, I think, um, for folks in getting started. And again, this is all .NET specific. Uh, so that's at this um, code project here, and it's a 30-minute tutorial that will walk you through some of the steps. 
All right, so the best way for learning regular expressions, um, I think, is uh, learning through doing. So there's going to be a number of expressions that are shown. I'll walk you through them. But as you start playing with doing edits, uh, I recommend um, talking to the Mark Edit listserv. There's a link to the listserv here. There are a number of people on that listserv, in fact, a number of them that happen to be in your area um, that are very good at regular expressions and, and in fact, um, answer most of the questions when they come up. Uh, before I ever get a chance to see them, uh, which is really nice for me because uh, occasionally they approach the, the problems differently than I would have. Um, and so I get to learn something when I see that. And so that's really great. All right, so what, the, what we're going to do, the plan is, is I'm going to go through these questions. I will talk about um, uh, the answers. And when the occasion arises, we will drop out of the presentation and we'll actually work through uh, the problem um, in, in Mark Edit. All right, so the first question I wanted to address because um, there it's, uh, it, it came up and, and this, these kind of things come up periodically um, is what's the difference between save, save as, and compile file into Mark? Um, for those of you who uh, um, aren't sure what we're talking about, um, this comes from in the Mark Edit program, in the Mark Editor, Under File, there is Save, Save As, and then Compile, File into Mark. Um, and those are replicated on these buttons here. There's a Save File and then a Compile File into Mark. So what do they actually do? Well, um, it actually depends. Um, and and I, I sometimes hate that that's the answer, but it really is. Um, and it depends on how you're working with the program. And probably the save one is the one that uh, can be the most confusing. Um, and the reason why is because uh, the save file, uh, the save function has been um, uh, modified a number of times to um, support kind of this uh, convenient um, access uh, to specific functions. So um, by default, uh, the way that the, the save works is that when you open a file, an existing file, um, so let's say I have a file on my desktop and it's a .mrk file and I open that file, when I click save it's just going to save the changes back into that file. If I have a .mrc file or a mark file and I've opened that within the mark editor, I've previewed it, so let's say I've right clicked on a .mrc file and uh, said that I wanted to preview it in the mark edit, editor, um, that will open the file as a temporary file. I can do all of my edits um, in that file, but when I click save, it's going to do the same operation as a save as. It's going to prompt you for a file name, and then it's going to save um, that data in the mnemonic format um, back on your hard drive as a .mrk file. If you open the mark editor and then open a file that's a .mrc file, a mark file, through the mark editor, um, so you don't uh, break it first, but you open it as a .mrc file um, and open it so that the, and then do your edits there. When you save it, it actually doesn't just save. It doesn't save the mnemonic. What it actually does is it saves the data back to that .mrc file. Um, and this is a little bit. This might not be um, uh, 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 intuitive. Uh, but the reason why it works that way is because that was essentially what I was hearing from the user community, um, that they were opening the files in, they were opening .mrc files in the Mark Editor, which wasn't a use case originally that I was uh, supporting. Um, and their expectation was, if they hit the Save button, that that data was being saved back into Mark. Um, not into the mnemonic format. And so there was a lot of questions that were coming up um, about why am I, why is it after I've done my edits and I save my button, hit my save button, when I go back to my MRC file, no changes have been made. And it was because the program was prompting them to um, save their changes and it was saving them back to a .mrk file, which wasn't what they were expecting. So that's how the save function works. Um, if you open from within the Mark Editor, a .mrc file, it will save the data um, directly back to that Mark file. It does not save the mnemonic file for you. If you need to save the mnemonic file, so you want to go back and, and edit that, that, um, that text-based file, uh, you actually have to save as and save that file directly to the desktop. 
Um, save as, that always prompts the user to select a file. Um, it's basically um, how you create a new mnemonic file. And this always saves data in the mnemonic file format, so that's the format that's read within the Mark Editor. Um, and then the compile file into Mark, this is actually how you turn your mnemonic record into back into a Mark record. Um, there are lots of different ways to do that. Um, like I mentioned um, earlier, there's a, a button on the menu bar that you can click that will compile the records. There's um, the option in the file menu um, that you can click um, to uh, compile records into Mark. Um, but when you're done compiling the records into Mark, it doesn't actually save the mnemonic data. You still have to click that save or save as button if you want to save the, the data that's in the Mark editor um, into that text file readable format if you ever want to go back and work with it again. Of course, you could always go back to your Mark file, break it, and, and reopen it and edit, uh, continue to edit it. Um, but that's the, uh, the, the workflow there. Um, and exactly how these three particular functions work and how their functions change um, based on um, how you open an individual file. And, and you will find, and we will talk about this as we go through, there are a number of functions within MarkEdit that work that way where if you interact with the application um, outside of the Mark Editor, it works one way, and if you work with it inside the Mark Editor, it works another. Okay, so that's that's the first question. Hopefully that answers that uh, sufficiently. Let's go ahead and move on to the second question. All right, so the second question is, is there a way to find records that specifically have a 650 uh, second indicator subfield 4? And so this actually comes up quite a bit on the list, uh, questions about how to find um, record data. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be indicators, but indicators are a good um, example of how this works. So I'm going to go through the, the um, answers on the slides, and then we're going to go into Mark Edit, and we'll actually go through um, a record set and, um, and walk through the steps. Um, so there are actually a number of ways to accomplish this task, and it really depends on what you're trying to do, uh, which will determine the best way um, to, to go about looking for this data. Um, the way I kind of categorize these is that you um, can pull data down as a, as a set of lists um, that then gets, uh, you can jump around to and look at the records that way, um, or you can pull out subsets of data uh, that can be edited. And those can either be subsets of data that exist within a separate file, um, or subsets of data that are pulled into the Mark Editor for editing. All right, so the first one that we'll look at is um, retrieving lists of data. Uh, the find tool is going to be um, probably the easiest way to retrieve a list of data. Um, and I'm going to um, actually uh, go ahead and um, uh, we'll talk about this and then we'll go back and do it. Um, there's a, essentially what you're going to be doing is you're going to be looking for these as um, regular expressions, especially if you're looking for indicator data. Um, the easiest way to do that is um, in this case you'll see the expression is uh, parentheses equals 650 dot and then there is a parentheses 3 and then a 4 at the end. Um, what that's essentially saying is I'm looking for a 650 field. Um, I don't care what the next three bytes of data are, and I want a 4 in the second indicator. Um, and when I run that as a regular expression, it will then go out and look at all of the data within your file and try and match against the uh, 650 fields um, and pull it together into um, data, these data things that are known as jump lists. Um, the jump list here is, is this is what this looks like. You get a list of data. It shows your data in context, um, so you can actually see um, how uh, the data is being represented within your records, and then you can see that you can actually jump to the individual record. And when you do that jump, you'll see that it actually jumps to the position where that record exists. So let's go ahead and, and walk through that process real fast. All right, so here's my Mark Editor, and just for the sake of making sure that it's easier for everybody to see, I'm going to bump up the screen size, and I'm going to change my font size to 12, because I'm not sure how um, large this shows across on the screen. All right, so I'll open my Mark Editor. Um, I'll go ahead and select a file. Uh, so here's a, here's a set of data. Um, and if I was interested in looking for um, a data file where I'm looking for any uh, records 
where the 650, say for example, the I'm looking for 650s with a subfield 2. Um, so here I have some record sets here that have that data in them. Um, I can go to my uh, find and then I'm going to do that, that style of regular expression. I'm going to create a grouping box so it's that uh, 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 open um, parentheses. I'm going to look for my field uh, 650 and then I get to decide do the, does the initial indicator matter or am I just interested in indicator 2. Um, at this point for, for this case I'll, I won't care about the initial indicator so I'm going to say 3 and so what that says is um, the period means any character the parentheses means any three characters so I'm going to match on the first the first part of the field is going to be equal 650 then anything in the next three characters and then I'm going to look for anything um, I'm going to match on anything that uh, is a 2 so that will get me um, anything with a second indicator of 2 I uh, check my regular expressions, I run find all, and I get my jump list here, which tells me that it's found 27 times, and in these particular records. And we can see then, if we look at the individual list, um, how those, uh, where those, what those, those individual items look like within the record. And I can select one um, and jump to that page, and you'll see that within the mark editor here, that's been highlighted. It actually highlights. Um, the individual um, record, the individual field that was found that I wanted to jump to so I can review. Now if, for example, I wanted to do something a little bit more interesting, oops, so do my find, let's say I wanted to find um, everything that was a specific, uh, like a number of different, so I wanted to find everything that wasn't, say, like a subfield 7, or a second indicator 7. Um, and in my record set, you can see that I have um, 650s with a 0, a 2, and a 7. Um, I can do that with a, the same regular expression statement. But instead of just saying, um, uh, instead of just saying 2, I have two options. Um, I can say 0 and 2 because I know that's what's in my data. Um, or I can say 0 and 2 because I know that's what's in my data. But what I actually want is I want to get everything that's not a 7. And so what I use is I use my, my little bracket, which means group. I use a caret, which means does not match. And then I use a 7, which means uh, doesn't match a 7. And so now I'm going to get all of the um, 650s where the second indicator isn't a 7. And so I check my regular expressions. I run my find all. And you'll see now that I get um, zeros, twos. There's 110 of these. Um, here I get uh, twos, twos, uh, zeros. Uh, one of the things that I'm finding that's interesting is that um, I actually have some data where there's a first indicator. Um, so maybe what I want to do is update this so I want to find anything where the first indicator um, isn't a blank. So I can do, again, that same kind of an approach. 650. Can I decrease my resolution and zoom in? Okay, let me see if I can do that real quick. Uh, do, 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 um. Let's see, is that that better? I can't tell if it uh, if it uh, this just a second. Let me stop sharing it and then share it back. I think that. It didn't uh, adjust the resolution. Is that any better? Um, I had somebody ask if I could adjust the screen resolution. Ah, great. Okay. Okay, so hopefully this will make it easier. All right, so let's say in this case, when I ran my last, when I ran my last one, I, I seen that there were some where indicators that had indicators that weren't blanks, and I'd like to actually collect those, um, just those, because I'd like to see what's going on. So I would do my dot, and this time two, um, because I'm only going to be looking at. Um, I, I, I do want to actually see the indicators, so I'm going to go ahead and tell it two. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I am going to um, give it the first uh, indicator that I'm looking for. So does not equal uh, blank. And then I'm going to look for the second indicator, which is does not equal 7. 
And so this will allow me to then um, collect information about uh, these sp specific um, uh, data elements. So I check my regular expressions and I do find all. Um, and that did not get me exactly what I wanted. Just like that was, uh, thought it would, but it didn't. So let's try that again. 652 um, does not equal, maybe I have to escape it as a double slash and does not equal 7. Let's try that one. There we go. All right. So this is the thing about regular expressions. You rarely get them right the first time, uh, which is always a bit of a trick. Um, I found that I have a record uh, that has these particular set elements. Um, and so this lets me then pull just that, that set of information together. Um, I'm gonna, uh, all right, so that's that question here. Let me go back to my... Slides. All right, um, just one second. I can see it looks like my data is offset. Um, let me change the other resolution so the monitor is the same. That way, hopefully, we won't get uh, this kind of offset look. 1366. 1366. There we go. That should uh, take care of this. I'm going to flip back and forth again for you so that we get the, the screens to set up. Hopefully that takes away some of the. Hopefully that takes away the blank space that I was seeing on the end. All right, uh, so that's the first one. So looking for the data within um, the, uh, the the that jump list. The second one is to actually create subsets of data. So this is where um, the user wants to actually create a file that they want to work with um, later, and they want to work with a subset of that data. Um, there are two ways to do this, and this is where it depends on if you're running within the Mark Editor or not. Um, if you're running within the Mark Editor, there's an option that actually lets you pull the subset of data into the Mark Editor, work with that data directly, and then save it back to the Mark Editor. Um, so you don't create a separate file, but you do edit um, the source file directly. Um, there's a second option where you can actually pull the data out and read it as a subset of data, and that happens outside of the Mark Editor. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, do this really quickly. So let's go ahead and take the same set of data. So here's my sample set of data. Uh, let's say that I needed to, I wanted to edit um, a set of this data, um, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to edit, um, say, like uh, uh, this, the, the data sets that had um, the, those indicators that, um, uh, the second indicators that weren't seven. Um, so what I would do is I would go into file. Um, if I wanted to edit them within the Mark Editor, I didn't want to create a second, second file, I'd go into Mark Editor, uh, select records for edit, this opens up this particular tool set. Um, I would change um, my uh, display field uh, to uh, 650. Um, I probably would not um, change the, uh, I wouldn't change the indicator order, or I wouldn't change the add a subfield to it. I would import my file. Um, so now I can see my indicators here. Um, and so in my search, I could do a search that says um, something like, uh, from the uh, starting point, um, uh, dot not equal to uh, seven, and run that as a uh, whoops, uh, it's a regular expression, and run that as a search, and you'll see that I get um, selections of records that I can then work with. Um, it selects a lot of them. Um, apparently, I have a lot of data. I have some data that's duplicated, so that's going to be tricky. Um, so that's going to be a little harder to do. Uh, maybe that's not a good example. <laughs> uh, let me do a, let me add a different subfield. Um, and then we can talk about why that doesn't work particularly well. Okay, um, so I'm going to do a, I'm going to do this in two steps. All right, so the first one I'm going to do is let's say you've pulled your records up and you want to add data that doesn't have call numbers. So in this case, that's what I've asked it for. I asked it for a call number, the 050. Um, I want to look for data that doesn't have a call number. Um, there's this text here that says display field not found. You can search for that data, um, but the easiest way to do it is just to select does not match. 
Um, and that goes ahead and selects all of the data that doesn't have that particular field. If I actually wanted data that had call numbers, then I could invert those selections. And then that takes the data that has call numbers rather than the ones that doesn't. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and re-invert those. So I want just the ones without call numbers. Um, now what I can do, um, since I open this within the Mark Editor, I can pull this data out and then edit it within the Mark Editor without having to create another file. So I hit my select. Uh, export selected. Um, the records have been exported. And so now in the Mark Editor, what you're going to see is rather than having um, the 52 or whatever, or the 100 and some odd records that were there, we have eight. You can see in the field count, there are eight. And so those eight represent the eight records that didn't have a call number in the 050. Um, and so here now I can look at them and I can see that this one has a call number in the 090. Uh, this one has an 096. Uh, but I can make my edit, so I'm just going to throw a quick edit into one of these fields. Um, and do that, so that way I can find it quickly. Um, and then when I, then I have some options. So if I want this data to go right back into the set of data that I was working with before without creating a separate file, I just click Save. And that's going to save my data back into my source file. And so my source file is going to get changed. Um, now, in order to do this, you can't delete or add new records once you've extracted a subset. Because what MarkEdit's doing is it's trying to remember where those data elements came from. So where in the original file did those uh, actual um, records exist? And if you add a record or delete a record from that, it screws up the, uh, the positioning and then you're going to have problems. Um, so as long as you're just editing that subset of data, I made my edits, um, I click save, and what you get is you get a different message box here. You'll see it says extract the data saved back to um, the file that I was working with. And then when I say OK, it closes the mark editor because it closes um, that subset of data. When I reopen my uh, source file, and go and look for the record, which I um, actually it's going to just be easier to search for it. Uh, let's see. Uh, right here. So here's the, the first record. We can see this is the record that I edited um, as a subset, but that was saved back to the original source. And we know this is the original source. We can look at it. There are 52 records here, so not the eight records that we were working with. Um, this took those eight records um, and save the changes back to the original 52 records. So what that does is this allows us um, to create, um, uh, to actually work with a very large set of records, um, to search against them, um, pull out subsets of those data, do all the global editing that you want to against that subset of data, and then save it back to your original source file. And that's actually really handy, especially when you need to do global edits that require conditionals. Um, if you have global edits that require some kind of a conditional value that's really difficult to express, um, but if you could pull those records out into a subset, it would be really easy to deal with because you could process them all at once. That's what that particular tool is really good at working, doing for you. You can pull out your subset, do those data field, do those data elements, and then put the data back without having to go through the process of writing regular expressions or dealing with having to work with all of this other variable data um, and, and trying to filter it out while you're trying to do the specific edits that you want to do. All right, so that's how it works from within the Mark Editor. So I note in, in this, in question two, um, I talk about on um, the next slide what happens when you run your subset. So you have the, the when you run your subset, you get um, uh, your subset of data and then save it back into, into the edit. The other option is to use the extract, delete, and select records option. And what this does is this allows you to either delete a selected set of records or extract a set of records out of a larger file that can then be worked on separately. And so what this is really good for is actually taking a very, very large file and pulling out chunks of that large file to work with separately and then to process into your ILS and every time you pull out a chunk of those records, your source file gets smaller and your, um, your, as you, you work with each one of those subsets. Um, and there are some special um, processing functions that go with it. 
Um, so let's go back to the program here. So the place where I find the extract selected and delete selected tool um, is under tools and it's selected records and you'll see delete and extract. If I select it, you'll see that it looks exactly like the function I just used when I was in the Mark Editor. It's the same tool. Uh, the difference is when it's run from outside of the Mark Editor, um, it works differently. And it knows that you're outside the Mark Editor because it doesn't have that reference um, to the Mark Editor application anymore. So again, I can, instead of just being able to import the file, I have to actually pick a file. So I, I go over here and I pick my file that I want to work with. Um, so I have my sample records. Um, I can set my display field and then import that file. So the reason why the display field is important, when I run a search in this search box, my search box here, when I run a search there, um, by default, it's just searching what's in the display field. If I want to search all of the data within the record, um, I would look at this checkbox here, and I would check search all record data. And then that tells MarkEdit, I'm not searching just what's in the display field. I actually want to search all of the records, uh, all the data within the records. If I want to search using regular expressions, I check the Use Regular Expressions box. If I need to be able to do multiple queries, what I want to do can't be found in one search, uh, but I want them all to come out as a single as a single. Uh, a single extraction, I check the retain checked items. And what that does is every time I do a search by default, MarkEdit resets the, uh, the checkbox list. But if I check that retain checkbox items, the MarkEdit holds on to it, and it will then keep adding to the checkboxes as you go through the process. Um, so let's go ahead and, and uh, do a quick search. Oh, and this is actually a good place to then show um, something else. Um, when I did my initial um, display field import, one of the things that happens is you're going to have records sometimes that have multiple fields. And the way that MarkEdit represents that is it puts a um, delimiter in between them, so with that pipe end. So if I was interested, for example, in searching for a set of records that had multiple fields, um, I wanted to know how many had two of a certain type of fields, I could actually look for um, that pipe end within my display list and run it and find out that I have 38 records that have multiple 650 fields. So out of those 52, 38 of them had, had multiple fields. Um, I can also do, again, that does not match. Um, I have four fields within my 52 record set that have no 650 fields at all. Um, and so that makes it so that I, I can do certain things. I can actually ask it to, to just select the fields that don't have um, the dot end in them by looking for the dot end, finding my 38 records, and then inverting the selections. And so now that will take it to just the items that don't have multiple 650 fields. Um, so this allows me to do a number of different things in my, my record sets. Um, let's say I wanted to do something else though. So I have my, my display fields. MarkEdit has a number of special processing tools um, within this record, within this particular function. Um, so let's say I wanted to select a range of records. So we know there's 52 records in this set. Let's say I wanted to select a range of records. I wanted records um, uh, 0, so 1, uh, through uh, let's say 10. Then what I can do is I can use a special um, uh, syntax, so r uh, number, colon, and then the, the record numbers I want to pick up, so 0 through 10, and then tell it to search. And you'll see that it's picked up record number 0 down to record 10. And so that lets me pick everything up as a range. Um, let's say I wanted to search here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change my display field back to the 245 subfield A. So this is my display field. Um, let's say I actually um, was interested in, actually, let's, let's do this. Let's say um, 650, because uh, I'm going to do two, two, two searches. So let's say the 650. The first thing I'm going to do is ask for things that do not match. But let's say I also wanted to search on the, sub the 245 um, subfield A, and I'm looking for, for, an for uh, titles that have the word annual in them. Um, I would click the check retained items, and I can use um, this F, so field, um, number, and then I enter in my field number, 245 subfield A, and then what I'm looking for, and then run that search. 
And so then 12 more records are selected. So it added to the records that I started with and added 12 more. And so now I can export these records into a different record set. So I can go ahead and click on Export Selected. If, for example, I didn't, I have a really large file and I don't want to actually search for stuff, I run a random set. There's this option here called Export Random that will actually allow you to tell it how many records, what percentage of the file you want to export, and then the Mark Edit will randomly select um, records until it hits that percentage. But I'm going to go ahead and select here. We're going to select um, Export a Selected Set, and then it asks me, would I like to delete the extracted records from the source file? And what that's letting me do is, let's say I want to, I'm, I'm doing a workflow where I'm starting with a big set of a big set of a file with a big set of records, and I'm going to pull out small sets and work with those, load those into my ILS. I don't want to keep having those record sets stay in my source file, so I would say yes. Um, in this case, because I'm doing something else with these record sets, I'm going to tell it no. So I tell it no. It asks me where I want to save my extracted records. I give it a uh, location, and the records get extracted. And so now, if I go back um, to my uh, my record set and look at it um, to my folder, uh, this folder here, um, you'll see that I have an extracted record set. And when I open that up into Mark Edit, there should be uh, 12 records. So I have 12 records now. Um, that are in this this file set that represent that extracted set of data that I was that I was looking for, looking at. So what I've done in the uh, in the slides um, is I went ahead and, and entered in the special options here, uh, the field number searching, the range number searching, um, so that you can see them there. There actually is one more special option um, that you can use within um, this, the, the tool. Um, I don't have an example of it, uh, but if you had a batch set of queries that you wanted to run um, against the display field, uh, so let's say I had um, a set of I, I, I wanted the, I put call number in as my display field. Um, I have a set of uh, seven call numbers that I need to search for and extract. Um, the, you can use the um, expression file not file colon uh, number colon and then the path to the file. And as long as every argument is separated as an individual uh, each, on each line, the program will read the file and do an individual search retaining um, the query items from each search uh, and pull those together. So you can actually do a batch query um, that way. Uh, and I'll update these slides because I, I actually hadn't uh, thought about um, putting that in. Um, but what that looks like here uh, is In the search box, you would see uh, file number colon, and then you would enter in the full file path. So my full file path, and then I would run my search, and then that actually would go through and pull the data back together, um, so that uh, so that the data actually shows up, um, so that you actually run multiple searches as part of that query, which is kind of interesting. All right, let's go back to my slides. All right, so that's question two. Uh, question three. So question three um, is actually kind of interesting and, and actually led to the development of a new, a new tool. Um, so uh, uh, this is actually why I like doing these kind of workshops. I get some interesting ideas. Um, and this was one of those where um, I had, uh, I've, this is a question that comes up quite a bit. Um, and so I thought that uh, I started by creating something that was specific for proxy statements um, and decided to change it to make it a little bit more broad. Um, so we're going to do we're going to do this in two steps. Uh, the first one is adding a pro so adding a proxy to my records. Um, so this is the complicated version. Um, you want to add an 856. Uh, you want to a record, but you want to pull a lot of different data from that record together. Um, there was a way originally to do this in MarkEdit, um, but it would have required um, doing a lot of swap field functions or copies and pastes. Um, now, not everybody's going to have a, a problem that's that complicated. 
So let's say we had um, a proxy task. Let's say we had a very simple proxy um, addition that we wanted to make. So in this case, let's say we have a set of URLs, and what we have is we have an easy proxy. Um, we have an easy proxy uh, system, and so we just need to add the easy proxy syntax um, to that URL. Uh, that's a fairly simple process, and we can do that using the replace function or using the edit subfield function. Um, the third option. And the option that I'm going to show you for the more complicated um, request, uh, in the slides it's called Build Proxy Tool. Um, I actually, before we, we showed up, before this, this uh, session started, I, I made some modifications to it. So now it's uh, mo a more generic build, a build field tool. So you can actually use this to build um, any field data, um, although it, it will work specifically for a proxy as well. Um, so we're going to go through both of those examples. Um, the build field tool will be available as soon as I update the program next time. All right, so let's look at the easy ones first. Um, the easy one um, is specifically around using a regular expression within the find tool. Um, in this case, we have um, an expression that's going to look for an 856 field, and then when it finds it, it's just going to pin the proxy uh, to um, your data set. Uh, for example, most uh, easy proxy setups will look like my proxy equal my proxy login equals and then the URL I'm trying to uh, look for. There is an, another easy proxy pattern that you can use, but I see that one a lot less option, often. Um, the other option to use is going to be the edit field function, which works um, very much like the replace function, um, except you don't have to define uh, the field as part of the regular expression. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at both of those really quickly before we look at the build tool. All right, so let's go ahead and grab ourselves a file. So we're going to go ahead and grab our, our sample set here. This sample set doesn't have any 856s in it. So before we get started, I'm going to throw a uh, fake 856 field into the record. All right, so we're going to go ahead and add that. So there are 52 added. So now we have an 856 in our records here. We can see them. All right, so I want to add a proxy to it. So we're going to start with the use case of I want to add um, an easy proxy-like statement to uh, my records. Uh, so in this case, my easy proxy-like statement, um, what I want this to end up looking like is I'm going to want it to look like um, equals my my proxy.edu slash login equals and then I want to add I want this URL to be the uh, the actual data that's going to be part of the um, the data that that is uh, being referenced by the proxy statement so in this case I can go to edit and replace um, and I'm going to go ahead and search for the 856. Uh, I don't care about the indicators in this case. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and get the subfield data. Um, there are two ways to do this. If I know for absolute certainty that the subfield U is going to follow, um, is going to be the first subfield in my record, I can reference it here. If I don't know that, then what I want to do is something like this. Uh, dot star, meaning grab everything, and then go back here and say uh, subfield U. So that way, if there's like a subfield Z or a subfield 3 in between the field number and the subfield U, I make sure I capture that. So I capture the subfield U. I'm then going to capture everything up to um, the next subfield indicator. Um, and then I'm going to grab anything that follows it, if there's anything that follows it. And then I'm going to go ahead and rebuild my 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 link. So I'm going to do subfield one or dollar sign one that references this group right here, the first um, parens item. The second parens item is going to be the subfield U. So I'm going to reference that. The next one is my data. So that should be the URL. So this is where I'm going to enter in my URL information. So HTTP my proxy. Dot edu slash login equals log in equals and then I'm going to add the data that follows it. So this is going to be the actual URL data. So dollar sign three and then if there's anything in the record behind it, so a four. And then I'm going to go ahead and click use my regular expressions button and I go ahead and run the replacement, 52 modifications. And if I go back and look at my record set now, you'll see here in that line 
that what we have is we have um, the field, subfield U. There wasn't anything between it, so subfield U is there. And then my proxy statement is appended um, before uh, the data that's here in uh, my record set. So that's one way of being able to do it. So that allows me to do re the replacements. Now the one thing I want to point out, so the reason why I use the replace function, when I use regular expressions, you'll notice that if I click on that drop down box, I can see the last 10 regular expressions I ran. So let's say I run this regular expression, I look at it later, and I find that something doesn't look right. I can go back to it, select it, make the changes that I need to make to it without having to recreate it from scratch. Same thing on the bottom. It keeps the last set of replacements, so I can select the replacement that I was using, and then I don't have to start from scratch, which is really nice, uh, especially within a replacement um, function. All right, so that's one way of doing it. The second way I mentioned doing it is with the edit field function. Um, you'll see that, the again, we're using a regular expression. Let's go ahead and walk through that one. So I'm going to remove... Um, my edits to the replace function so I get it back to looking like um, a regular field. Uh, so I'm going to go now to tools and then I go to edit field data. This allows me to target a specific field so where the replace function I actually have to include the field data um, because I need to tell it that I'm looking at a specific field. In this case I just enter in the field that I'm looking for and then my regular expression only has to include information about the field itself. So in this case, again, I don't know if my record starts with a different subfield. I'm going to go ahead and use subfield U. I'm going to look for anything that's not a, uh, a subfield after the subfield U, and then I'm going to take everything after that. And then I can go ahead and run my replacement, dollar sign $1, dollar sign $2, um, HTTP, myproxy.edu slash login equals dollar sign three dollar sign four and then check my regular expression box and process that data and again if we look at it we see that that uh, handles my proxy data so that allows me to um, a different way of doing the same process maybe this is a little bit easier uh, the last method which I'm going to see if I if I mentioned is good. The last method is actually using the edit subfield function. And the edit subfield function has some specific um, mnemonics that allow you to actually prepend and append data to data that already exists within a field. So in this case, let's go ahead and remove the subfield, the, the, the proxy information. I want to append, prepend um, data to my subfield U. So I would go to my tools, my edit subfield data. I'm going to enter in the, the field that I'm working with, the 856, the subfield that I'm working with, subfield U. I use a caret and a B, which means um, to uh, prepend, so add to the beginning. And then I'm going to enter the data that I want to add to the beginning. So I'm going to put in my data, my proxy.edu slash login equals. And then I'm going to tell it, um, I'm not going to use any of these options because I just want to add to an existing field. If I checked new subfield only, it would add new subfield. I don't want that. I'm going to leave all that unchecked. I'm just looking to add it to existing data. I replace the text. 52 modifications made. And if we look at it here, we'll see again my um, subfield data has been modified, so I have my easy proxy URL. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the easy example. Let's see what the question here is. Uh, yes, this is being recorded. And I, I believe it will be shared. All right, so let's talk about the, the, the new way of, uh, of handling this data. So this is actually um, uh, something that I worked on uh, last night. Um, and you'll see, and I'm going to show you where it's going to live. And this will actually be a function that will be available as a task um, because there's, a, there's some actual general use to this. Um, 
So the question that was asked specifically was how do I build a proxy statement when I need to pull a lot of information from my MARC record into that proxy statement? And that's a hard thing to do. Uh, MARC edit has swap field functions which allows you to move some data around. Um, but again, that's your, your, let's say your, your usage pattern um, is something like example number two here on the slide where you, it's an Iliad record where you have to pull a title and an OCLC number and an ISSN. You need specific data elements and you need to put them in a specific order and they need to be in, a, in the field. So what you really need is more of a pattern that you can use to, to fill it out. So what I've done is I've, I, I started this as, a, as a, a build proxy tool, but realized that this is something that could be used to build any field. There's a lot of times where um, folks need to build, for example, if you're an innovative library, you want to build that command line upload tool, the 949. Uh, 949, yeah, the 949, 945, 949, I think, um, where you want to actually designate the overlay code in addition to a number of other elements. Uh, the, the process for doing that had been to use the swap field tool to pull the various pieces of information out of the record and build that up through that, that record set. Using the build, the build new fields tool, you could actually do that in a single step. And you do that by actually giving it the tool the pattern of what data it's going to extract from the record. So we're going to use, um, as our example, the proxy statement. Um, for the question, if you'll remember, uh, the question was specifically um, how to add an 856 to all, all records that use the OCLC number in the 035. So that, that's already tricky because you're probably going to have to take the, OC, those, the o, OCLC um, uh, qualifier off of that OCLC number. Um, then we have the title. Again, a little bit tricky because you can't just take the title data. This data actually has to be URL encoded. So we have to encode the data into a URL format. Uh, the ISSN if present. Um, and then we want to bring it together. So this, is, this, is, this particular instance is for creating links that can be used by Iliad so that you can do um, an open URL request to, to request the record data sets, request the records. All right, so let's go back to our, our tool here. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go out and we're going to walk through this process of how this works in MarkEdit. So the new tool is called the Build Records tool. Again, we, we deleted our, our set, so here's our record set. So we can go up here to Tools, and you'll see this new option um, once MarkEdit gets updated uh, that's called Build New Fields. And so when I select this, I get this, this tool. And what the tool is asking for is asking for a pattern. And so in this case, what I need to give it, I need to give it all of the information to build this particular um, record, to build this particular field. So I need to give it the equal field number. Um, I need to type in all of the field data as I would like it to show up within my, my, my record set. But in the places where I need to pull data from other mark fields and subfields, I use these mnemonics. In, bra in, in these uh, brackets, I type in the field number and I give it the subfield of the data that I want to pull out. So I have already write, written out um, the example here. So let's go ahead and, and put in our pattern. So equals 856. The indicators we're going to use is 40. Um, subfield uh, U. And then in the subfield U, um, I have this particular pattern. Um, I have uh, the Iliad URL. I have some information about the form, um, which is generic to all of them. I need the, the title. So it's uh, 245 subfield A. We can see that here, 245 subfield A. I need the ISSN, so if the ISSN is there, I'm going to pull the 022 subfield A. Uh, the call number, so for this record set, I'm going to call the call number is the 050 subfield A. Um, and then um, for the, the, the record, the, the OCLC record number, I'm going to pull the 035. And I'm going to designate the qualifier that I want to pull. Now what MarkEdit is going to do is it will take the data after the qualifier. So anything that shows up in the mnemonic um, is data that gets filtered out. Um, so here's my, my qualifier. So because I thought that this could be used for things other than um, just building 
uh, proxy statements, I had to add two additional functions, that, two additional options that I wasn't thinking about before. Uh, the first one was to escape the data for the URL. So in this case, I do want to check that. Um, when I pull title data, the title data could have spaces in it, it could have special characters. Those characters need to be escaped. Um, otherwise, when the data gets imported into your form, um, it's going to get lost because maybe there's data there that, um, that actually is um, valid for another form element. So for example, like a question mark or a dollar sign. So you need to escape the data from the URL um, if you're doing this for a proxy um, statement. If you're not doing it for a proxy statement, don't escape the data because you don't need to. Um, the second thing is you get to decide, um, do I want to replace an existing field that might be there already? So in this case, um, I have um, and I have an existing field um, because I, I have one in this data set that we had already created. Um, so I could check that I just want to replace it, or I can add a new one um, if one's not present. If I don't check that, uh, then all that it's going to be doing is it's going to be adding a new field. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and delete my current 856s just so that we're starting fresh. All right, so we don't have an 856 anymore in the record because I'm actually going to build one through the tool. And I'm going to tell it to go ahead and replace it or add a new one if it's not present. And then I'm going to go ahead and process the data. And 52 files are added. And so if we look at our 856 now, look at our 856 here, um, we see it, it looks very different. So what's happened is it's actually gone out and it's pulled the information. So in this case, from the title, you'll see the percent two zeros. That means it's escaped the data anywhere where there was a space um, and done it through the title. It found an ISSN, so it created the ISSN marker. Uh, the call number came from the uh, 050 subfield A. And then you'll see the OCLC number, which exists right here. The qualifier has been removed. And the data shows up in the, in the, o, in the OCLC number field. Um, so because I checked it to escape the data, it went ahead and built the data that way. So I can use this, though, to build any field. So if I have a pattern um, of how a data field, a, a new mark record field, should be created, um, there's a pattern I can use. So what data elements need to be pulled out, I can use this tool to extract those data elements at one time and build a new mark record field based on that information. And whether or not I overlay existing data or create new data, um, so if I, if I leave that, if I check that, I'm overlaying or creating new data. If I leave it unchecked, I'm just creating new data. Um, so I get to decide how I'm going to be creating new fields. So that's a new tool. Um, this will, like I said, this will show up um, in uh, the next version of MarkEdit, so sometime this week. Um, and this will be part of the, uh, the task um, options, the automation options, which, which there's a question about that we'll walk through in a minute, um, so that folks can um, actually automate this as part of their process um, and use it in their, in their workflows. So before I move on, is there any questions about that? Because that is a, it is a new tool, and um, it's, it's slightly different, I think, than the way that a lot of the other tools work within MarkEdit, since it's more pattern-based. I'll, I'll keep an eye out while I, while I start working on the next set. All right. So the fourth question that was asked, um, and there, there, the fourth question that was asked um, was about a count. Um, when working with the RDA helper, uh, specifically around um, deletion of or the generation of the GMD, um, uh, folks would like to see uh, counting information. So one of the things that uh, I uh, so one of the things that I have to say is that the the RDA helper doesn't actually keep a track of all of the uh, changes that it does, um, at least not in a way that it can provide um, that data back to the users. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't track the changes that have occurred within the RDA helper if you absolutely want to. Um, the way you would do this is actually using um, the field count tool. Um, it's a little bit clunky. 
uh, but the way that you would be able to accomplish this is actually to run a field count before you run the RDA helper and then to run a field count after you run the RDA helper. Um, so for example, in my, my data set here, which, which doesn't have um, any, uh, I'm going to go ahead and clear this and, and start clean. So in my data set here, this data set is, is not, doesn't have RDA data in it. Actually, it has some RDA data, but not a lot of it. Uh, if I go to my reports and my field count, um, I can look at information about my record set. And if I look at it, I can see that right now there are um, 19 records that have the 336, 337, 338. This is also how I can check to see if there are any subfield H records. If I look here, I can see the 245. If I right click on it um, and ask to count subfields, I can see that there are at this moment no subfield H's within this record, so there would be no GMDs. So if I created, if I used the RDA helper to create a GMD, um, any new subfield H's would be created by the RDA helper. So I ran that, I run my field count. If I run the RDA helper now, um, and I'm going to go ahead and just run all the items. Um, but I will instead delete the GMD, I'll create one, uh, and I go ahead and process that data. Then I can go back to the field count, and I can see information about the record. And if I look at the 245 in this case, you should really see why there's an extra title in this one. You can see that there, obviously, whatever is in this record, there still isn't a, a reason to create a, a, a GMD. They're probably all book records. There must not be any electronic records or anything in this set. Um, but I can look at um, here and see that there are now 52, 336 records, 337, uh, 338. So I can use the field count box um, to keep track of how the records change um, between uh, between runs um, so that I can actually uh, keep track of, of like number counts. Um, if I actually wanted to see how the records changed, I actually wanted to see how the records changed, um, that's possible too. Uh, Mark Edit has a, a diff tool. Um, it's called Mark Compare. Um, if we don't get questions later on, I, I'll show you how, to, how it works. Um, if, if, we have time at the end. Um, essentially what that does is it will, you can take two record sets, compare them together, and it'll give you back um, a diff report um, for the individual record sets. So you can actually see what fields have been added, what fields have been deleted, how the record's been changed. Um, and they show up via an HTML report that's color coded. So you can see additions and deletions fairly quickly. Um, but here, um, what I did is the same thing I just did on the screen. I did a field count before I ran um, the RDA helper. I do a field count after I run the RDA helper. And I can see then um, uh, differences between, between the record sets. Um, back to the question, um, is there a way to get a count from the RDA helper itself? Uh, the problem is that, the, at least at this point, the RDA helper doesn't track that information, partly because it's, it's doing a lot of different things. Um, in order to track all the stuff that happens within the RDA helper, you would um, be tracking uh, a significant a number of um, changes that happen. And I guess uh, part of um, the reason it doesn't provide that information is I'm not quite sure really how to provide it in a, in a report that would be useful. Um, because just telling you that you created, for example, X number of uh, 338 fields is interesting. It's information I can get from other places, but it doesn't actually tell me, um, you know, if, if, it, if I created it, uh, multiple 338 fields in, in individual records or, or some of the things about that. I, I don't know. If, if the person who wrote this question can give me a good use case, um, then I could, I potentially might be able to look at, um, providing a little more information on the, the reporting mechanism. Um, but, uh, but at this point, this would be the way that you would go about um, looking at how the records changed um, between runs with the RDA helper. The second question actually looks like they found uh, uh, it, uh, it's a, uh, the second question that was asked was, <clears throat> there see a, a double count when running the edit indicator. 
um, when running it, uh, they, the, the indicator tool reports um, uh, twice as many changes as uh, records, apparently. Um, I have a, a guess as why this is happening um, by quickly taking a look at the code last night. Um, the mark edit tool is actually tracking um, indicators change, not records changed. Uh, and since there are two indicators, whether you change them or not, if you change one indicator, it treats the both indicators as changed, so you end up getting duplicates. Um, that really didn't make any sense when I was looking at it. Um, I, there was probably a reason when I was doing it the first time where it did. Um, but I'm thinking that this is probably um, the way that the count is providing information back. It's probably most people would, would consider that a bug. They actually would probably like to see um, either a uh, number of changes made, which actually were the actual number of changes made, um, or number of records edited. And I'm not quite sure yet which of those two, um, which of those two reporting options would be more useful, uh, getting back the number of records edited or the number of times um, an indicator was edited, or maybe even both indicators edited, number of records edited. I don't know. Um, but uh, but I'll take another look at um, at how at least fixing the the particular account right now so that at least whatever it tells you in the label right now whether it's records edited or indicators edited the the number represented actually represents the the number of items that were were actually touched rather than just um, a very gross look at um, the the both indicators paired together. All right, question number six. This is a good question. Uh, the question is, there are a batch way to insert a subfield between two existing subfields. So for example, um, adding a GMD uh, to a 245 field. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so there is actually a note um, for how you do this in the help file, the mark at a help file. Uh, you can, not many people realize the help file is there. I will tell you up front, it is a bit out of date, um, but it does exist. So if you go to help and contents and help and click on that, there is a help file that opens. Um, your help file will not say this page can't be displayed. Mine does because this is my development machine. So the help files don't actually exist in the same place. Um, but you can actually use these and go through these topics and look at how the editing functions work and specifically there's an edit function um, for working with the edit subfield data which will um, tell you uh, how to do this and I've linked it in the slides here uh, put a note to it here in the slides so you can actually read it uh, but I can actually show you how this works because this is this is actually applicable to not just the GMD um, but this is how you would you would do um, subfield um, insertion positionally for any uh, field where maybe you are inserting subfield data uh, so this is the the edit subfield tool um, and this is the GMD example um, and I'm gonna go ahead and pull it out uh, and walk you through uh, the steps that, that take place here so let's go ahead and open our record set so here's our sample record set. Um, we're going to find that in the 245 field here, there's a subfield B. We actually want our GMD, and we're going to pretend all of these are electronic resources. We want our GMD to show up uh, right here. It needs to follow. It needs to come before the colon, and it needs to come before the subfield B. All right, so the way that this is going to work is you go to Tools, um, Edit Subfield Data, we enter in the field that we want to work with, the 245 in this case. Now instead of entering in a general subfield, because that's not what we're doing, we're not inserting just a subfield, we want to tell a little bit about how we want to insert it, MarkEdit has a special syntax for telling it that it wants, you're not going to just insert a subfield to the end of the record, because let's, let's say I, I didn't do this, let's say I just put H and typed in uh, electronic resource, and told it to add the subfield when not present and then replace the text, what we get is this. Um, Mark edit is going to, by default, add the new subfield to the end of the existing field. That's not what we want to do, though. We want to put it in a position, a specific position. So in this case, we're going to enter the 245. But instead of saying um, subfield H, 
we're going to use brackets to tell MarkEdit which fields we want to insert it after and which fields we want to insert it before. So the first set of brackets are going to be the fields that we are going to insert our particular subfield data after. So in this case, we're going to do the A, the P, and the N. And the way that MarkEdit reads this data is from right to left. So as it's evaluating your 245, it's going to say, is there a subfield in? If there is, then I want to put the data that I'm going to enter here after it. Is there a, if there's not a subfield in, it's going to go to the next one. Is there a subfield P? If there's a subfield P, then I'm going to stop and I'm going to insert my data after the subfield P. And if there's no subfield P, it's going to drop down to the subfield A. And if there's a subfield A, then it's going to insert it there. My next statement is going to be the data that I want to insert before. And I'm going to do that again where I'm reading it um, right to left. And so I'm going to put in a C and I'm going to put in a B because, um, so in this case, if it found uh, the B, that's where it, was, it would insert it before the B. If it finds a C, it's going to insert it before the C. So it's going to read right to left. Then I have my field data statement. So mark edit when it reads data, it treats everything between the subfields as a as a as a subfield. But in this case, I don't want to do that. Um, I'm actually there's punctuation rules I need to follow. So for example, the subfield B, I don't want that colon to get in the way. It's not part of the subfield A. So I'm going to tell it some punctuation that I'm okay with ignoring. So I'm going to give it um, a space, um, a slash, slash, and a colon. So those are going to be my my values that I'm going to tell it if it runs across those elements, go ahead and treat those as um, space in between the subfields. And so when it sees them, it's going to push those off, it's going to push them to the right, and it's going to su insert the subfield before them. So then I need to add the data that I'm going to replace. So subfield H, electronic resource. Make sure that I deleted the ones that were there before. I did? Okay. And so then I'm going to add that field if not present. And I go ahead and replace that text and get my modifications. And so now when I look at it, I see here the subfield A, so it puts it behind it. I forgot that there was a period there. So um, I could have, if I was going to do this, I would probably undo it and go back and add a period to my, my, um, my list of punctuation to ignore. Uh, but if I go down to my subfield B right here, we'll see that the record did insert the subfield H between the A and the B and seen the colon in the space as elements that aren't part of the subfield A. So it pushed those away and dropped the, uh, the new insertion between those, protecting the punctuation that was found at the end of the subfield A between the subfield B. This used to be the way that you had to do all the GMD work. And you had to assume that everything within your file was going to be a, a specific GMD data element. Um, so you could just insert them all this way. Um, obviously now you have the RDA helper. And if I was going to do GMD insertion, and I wanted my GMDs to be representative of the material type that's been um, designated on the record itself, I would use the RDA helper. Um, because it will actually use the elements of the record to determine what the uh, GMD ought to be. Um, if I don't care, um, let's say I have a bunch of book records, but I know that they actually represent my electronic resources, then I would use a method like this so that I could insert um, my GMD across globally across the entire set, um, that, that specific de designation, and include it um, in my record set. Now the GMD here is an example. I can use this pattern, the pattern that we used here, we can use this pattern of bracketing and then using subfields um, to tell it where to insert before and after um, as a way to work with any MARC record data. So for any uh, MARC field where you have to positionally insert a subfield to that MARC field, this is the process that you would go about, that you could go about using to insert that data. Are there other ways to do this? There are. Um, now the GMD is tricky because there's so many data, there's so many possibilities of when that data element could be inserted. So in that case, 
you would have to know exactly what your data looked like. But in the case, for example, of um, uh, of like say like a um, of of like a call number where I need to insert I need to insert a new subfield um, or or uh, let's say um, uh, let's say a 300 where I know uh, what the pattern is always going to look like. I could use a regular expression to group my subfield codes and then just drop a subfield in between the pattern elements. Um, it's much more difficult. It's more complicated because it assumes that you know exactly what your data looks like and your data never changes. Um, so in that case, it, it, it's, uh, it's possible. But the edit subfield tool here and this method of doing um, uh, conditional inserts based on position um, is probably the easiest and, and most reliable way of dropping a subfield into um, a new into an existing mark record in a specific position based relative to the other subfields within that record set. And like I said, if I was doing the GMD, the better example at this point might be to just generate the GMD. All right, so question seven. Um, so this question kind of has been answered already. Um, is there a way to insert uh, the three the same three-letter code in front of a uh, in front of a specific field? For example, um, uh, letters in front of a call number um, or something like that. Um, we had made I made reference that the uh, uh, edit subfield function um, has a special set of codes that you can enter into the find box, which tells MarkEdit to uh, prepend, append, or actually change a subfield value. Um, and so we have um, the values here, prepend, append, and change the code. Um, in this case, uh, I have here an example of, um, I have another example of how to do it, so let's just quickly, I'll show you again. Um, let me undo that. So let's go to the subfield data. We're going to just append data to an 050. So 050, subfield A. Um, we'll do the P, the, the B, and this is prepended. And I'm just going to go ahead and replace the text. And so now anywhere where there's an 050, and you'll see them here, you'll see that the data has been prepended. By the same token, we can append data. So if we do this same thing, 050. Um, subfield A, but this time use a subfield E, we can prepend data or append data. And if we go back and look at our data set again in the 050, we'll see in the subfield A that the data has been appended. Lastly, if I wanted to change a subfield code, Let's say that that subfield A in the 050 shouldn't be an, a, a subfield A. Um, it, so we've got subfield A, that little bracket and a C, and we're going to change it to an E. And we go ahead and replace that data. Now when we look at the 050, you'll see that that subfield's been changed to an E. So we have these different mnemonical values, these different special codes that we can use within the edit subfield tool to make it easy to append and prepend data. Um, one of the other things that you can do um, with these values is you can attach them to search, search terms. So let's say I want to append data to the 050 but only if the data starts with uh, a, uh, a QP. Oh, did my audio just cut out? Um, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, well, it says no. Okay, so I will, if, if the audio is, if you're not hearing my audio, let me know. Um, it, it says it's supposed to be talking. Um, so anyways, if, um, if I wanted to do this where um, I wanted to apply a value, so let's say I wanted to prepend data, but only if the the subfield if the subfield A had a, a QP. So let's use the first value for an example. We would enter in our 050 the subfield data that we're looking for. We're looking to uh, prepend, so the subfield B, and I'm looking for QP. So I'm going to prepend to that. And I can go ahead and run my, my version again. And you'll see now the prepended data replaces the QP data and it prepends into it. 
So if I needed to keep that QP, I would have entered in um, prepended data and I would have added the data I was searching for as part of that. Uh, but this allows me to prepend and append data using search data. So again, I could append the same way. I could search for data at the end of a line and prepend to that. So actually remove that data and, and prepend to it. Um, so it gives you a little bit of flexibility there in terms of how you add um, data to a field, to add data to the beginning or end of a field. The other way to do this, obviously, um, would be doing it through a regular expression. Now, I think those those special codes are probably the easiest way to do it um, because they are uh, because they. Um, they're just one code. You don't have to know a regular expression in order to do it. But if you're a regular expressions person or you want more control over how a specific um, replacement happens, you can use a regular expression. So in this case, um, I'm going to use the exact same field, the 050, and we're going to prepend data to it. Um, but it, we're going to do it using, using the regular expression tool. So we'll go ahead and undo the last thing we did, and we'll go and do the replace function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the 050. Um, so I'm going to look for the 050. Um, I'm not going to care about any of the indicators. I need the subfield A. And then I'm going to pre prepend my data. Um, so then I get everything after that. So I'm going to do subfield 1, 2, and then that's going to get me the first group is the field group, the second group is the subfield A. After that I'm going to add my prepended data, and then I'm going to add the data that follows. And if I check use regular expressions and replace that data, you see we get the same, we get the same result as if we use the edit subfield function. Same result, um, but we had to know a little bit of regular expressions in order to do it. Now, the nice thing is that with a regular expression, um, I have the option to do a number of different things in terms of, I have more flexibility. Let's say I need to prepend data, but I need to find data, but I can't use that kind of straight in-string find that we've seen in the, um, in the edit subfield function, that the data I'm looking for is going to be variable. In that case, using the regular expression option is going to be your much better option because you're going to have a lot more um, flexibility in terms of looking for additional data elements um, or doing conditional data since you can add or clauses into your find um, that you would have in using just the edit subfield function. All right, so let's go back to our slides here and let's see what the next question is. Oh, um, and I won't run it, but just uh, so you know, um, the replace function, anything you can do in the replace function, generally you can do in the edit field function. Um, here's that example of the 050, um, looking for the subfield A, looking for the data after it, and then how you do a prepend into using just the edit field function. The edit field function really is a convenience function for you, um, so you don't have to deal with that initial, I need to, to say I'm looking for this uh, field, ignore the, the indicators part, that first, uh, that first group element. You can always take that off if you do the edit, sub, edit uh, field data tool, um, which uh, targets specifically um, the, the field data itself. Um, one thing I should make note of, if you notice in the edit field data tool, um, it doesn't show you indicator data. Um, so if you need the indicator data as part of your query, um, you're using that as a conditional. Um, again, one of the reasons why you might use a regular expression, um, you would need to use the replace function because the edit field function really is about editing the field data and it treats the indicator data differently. All right, so question eight. So these are actually some interest. This is actually a, a cool question because not many people know this. Um, it's one of these things that um, I, I uh, use myself um, locally uh, when I'm doing uh, uh, ed edits to, to data occasionally, um, and I need to send the edits to somebody for review. Um, Mark Edit has the ability to do comments. Um, so the question uh, where this kind of comes up is uh, the question was in a file containing many records, um, you can ask MarkEdit to jump to a record. So this 
assumes that you know a little bit about how MarkEdit renders data within the editor. MarkEdit breaks large record sets into pages. Uh, by default, each page has about 100 records, but you can each user, a user can change that to a larger page or a smaller page. Um, and when you want to move within MarkEdit, there's a set of controls on the bottom of the MarkEdit of the editor where you can go back and forth between pages. Um, but you also can use the jump to record or jump to page uh, function to jump around. Um, in this case, the question is, I have a very large file um, and I wanted, and I, I've, I've searched, I found a record, but I don't know what the record number is. Um, so how do you jump to records or how do you know um, what a record number is in a file? Um, there is a way to do that in MarkEdit. So one of the things, that, and, and it's going to use the, the, the functionality that's, that's noted in the bottom of this slide. One of the things MarkEdit, Mark Engine has the ability to do is ignore data that's in a Mark record. Um, but it has to be marked a certain way. So MarkEdit's uh, Mark mnemonic format um, has the ability to accept comments. So in MarkEdit, every Mark field starts with an equal sign um, in the mnemonic field format. Within the mnemonic field format, comments start with the pound sign. So you'll see in the example here, you have the LDR, then you have a pound sign that says this is a comment, and then you have the equal 05 and 008 that comment will be ignored. When MarkEdit's reading the file and processing to compile that data back into Mark, when it sees the comment, it skips the line. Now you can save that into, you can save that mnemonic file, that in your mnemonic file format, but again, every time it sees that data, when it compiles it back to Mark, those comments go away. Now the reason this is important is that MarkEdit uses those comments to allow you to use a process to mark record numbers. This is, um, I realized as I sat down looking at it, probably not the best place for this particular function to live. Um, and I may rethink about, rethink where I, why I've put it here. Um, but there's a tool in MarkEdit called Generate Control Numbers, which is why I'm saying it's probably not the best place to have this. Um, but the Generate Control Numbers was created really for small libraries that don't have OCLC numbers in their record, and they need to generate some kind of a control number for their record sets. MarkEdit remembers every control number it generates. Um, it lets you create control numbers as a pattern. Um, and you can insert control numbers into your records using this tool. Well, one of the interesting things that was added to this tool kind of as an afterthought because somebody had had, had kind of this same question was they wanted to be able to number their records. And so there's an option um, at the bottom called Mark Record Numbers. So if I go to a record, and I'm going to go ahead and grab one uh, with a, a handful of records in it. Um, so in this case, there's... Uh, there's not a whole lot. Of, actually, let me get one with just a, a few more records so we have pages between, so you can see how this works between pages. Uh, sample files, here we go. Alright, so here, um, if you look down on the, the bottom of the, the Mark Editor, um, down here where the, the mouse is uh, highlighting things, um, these are the, the controls that will jump you to the next page or to the last page or the end page. And you'll see here that this gives you number of records per page. Up on top here in the edit function, there's a jump to. This lets me jump to records. Um, but if I've moved, let's say I'm, I'm on this page and I'm in this record, uh, what record number am I on? I don't know. Um, I, I, I have no idea. Well, uh, if I go to tools, um, and generate control numbers, I can get my control number tool and I can check mark record numbers. Um, again, this is where I think I, I probably will pull this out um, or at least add another um, shortcut to it so it's easier to find. Um, but you add mark record numbers, uh, tell it OK, and the tool goes out and generates for you, um, it marks your, your records now. And I, let me see, is it done? I think it's done. Let's see. Yeah, so it's done. So uh, the first record doesn't get marked. Um, it's one of those things that uh, I need to figure out why the first record doesn't get marked. But every record after that does. So here you got record number two, record number three. So if I jump a few pages ahead 
and I get stuck down in the middle of the page and I want to know what record number I'm on. Here we go. I'm on record number 677, 678. Um, so if I need to jump between them, I can go to uh, here and go to jump to record. Let's say I wanted to jump back uh, to 665. Uh, again, you can see um, Oh, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. Um, so here's 665. So you can see the record numbers. They get embedded into the file. Um, I don't have to remove those. Uh, if I keep working with MarkEdit, those, those comments, they're just ignored. Uh, MarkEdit will just print them. Um, it doesn't see them as records. Uh, it doesn't see them uh, it, when you compile them. It doesn't do anything with them. They're just there. And they're there really for you. And so you can keep, you can, if you have a need to be able to generate record numbers, um, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, now, as I noted, the record numbers on the tops of pages for some reason don't show up. Um, it's easy though. Uh, if you go to the next one, 602, so that's obviously record number 601. Um, I'll see if I can figure out. I've, it's one of those things that uh, has been kind of tricky in terms of figuring out why it doesn't show that data. But, um, but anyway, so that's how you would generate record numbers and how you could create comments <clears throat> in your mark records uh, so that if you needed to pass your records off to somebody else, if somebody else was going to use them, or you just needed to make a note for yourself um, because you were working somewhere and you stopped, you wanted to add a comment talking about where you stopped, um, you can certainly do that um, within mark edit and those comments would then be ignored at the point where it compiles the data back to mark. All right, uh, the next question um, was specifically about automating workflows. Uh, the question came through uh, as a um, set of, uh, but what I, what I got was a, a, a Word document um, that showed a set of tasks, that, a, set of, um, a set of steps using the edit subfield tool um, that were being used over and over again. Um, and the question was, is there a way to automate this process? Uh, so that each time um, they have to go through and work on these data sets, they don't have to run um, three separate subfield edit tools, you know, edit windows. They don't have to do three, ta three, three of, these, um, of these boxes. There's a way to do it with just one. Um, there is, actually. Uh, let me see if I, yeah, there we go. Um, MarkEdit has uh, an automation uh, function. Um, it's almost like a macro recorder, but it's not quite really, um, where you can actually stack edits against each other um, and, and then run them through either a key, single keystroke or run them just by selecting them from a menu. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and show you where those live. Um, for those of you who are at the workshop, we touched on this, so hopefully uh, this will be new to a number of folks. But um, I'll show you, since it was a question that was asked, I'll show you where these, these live. Um, all right, so let me go back here. All right, so task automation. Um, undo that. I don't know what it's doing. Let me, let me grab a smaller record set. Because I, I really don't want need to run anything here. All right, so task automation happens under the tools menu. Um, there's this thing called manage tasks, and when I open this up, um, this is how Mark Edit uh, you load tasks or uh, macros into the program. So let's say um, I'm new to the tool. So if I was new to the tool, um, these would not exist. They would be this would be empty. And what I need to do when I start is I need to make a task. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new task. I'm going to give it a name. Whatever you want to call it. Uh, go ahead and give it, give it a name. A uh, couple things about tasks. Um, if you have a set of steps that you're going to need to duplicate over and over and over again um, within... Uh, so let's say I, uh, let's say I have a, a set of... Let's say I get um, 10 vendor files. And in those vendor files, I have my, my set of steps. Um, I have 10 steps. And in those steps, uh, three of them are always replicated over and over again. Uh, I can actually make a task that just has those three steps. And then in um, the task I make for specifically that vendor file, I can reference that task that has just those three items. 
and then not have to duplicate those things over and over and over again. So let me uh, show you what I mean. So I'm going to create two tasks. One of them is going to be what I'm calling a task library. This is my um, these are these are the actions that I would perform every time, regardless of the vendor I was working with. And then this one up here is going to be my task for vendor number one. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to edit my task that um, uh, I would do the same thing over and over again. I'm going to give it a description. This is my uh, general um, uh, task library and I'm going to go ahead and give it some some things that it's always going to do. I'm going to create a new field and one of the things you're going to see now um, this is kind of like a macro recorder. It opens up the I, I said I wanted to add a new field so it opens the new it opens the add delete field function. You'll see that visually um, the, the, the box is the, the, the materials on the left have been disabled and the box itself has turned color. This is to tell you that it is actually doing um, a task, it's doing task work. So I'll enter in the data that I'm going to work with. So I'm going to go ahead and add um, to every one of my records. I, I was going to add a note. So I'll add my note. So you'll see it gets dropped into my task list. Uh, the second thing I'm going to do um, in my list is, is I want to run um, the RDA helper and I'm gonna, I, I would like that to run on, on all of my stuff. I'm going to delete the GMD. I'm going to keep these options. And then the last thing that will be something that I'll do on every one of these is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to um, delete uh, the 050 because that's not going to be because uh, I, I just decided I don't want them there. All right, so that's the task. I'm going to do that for every vendor that I work with. So that's my task list. So then I go to my vendor. So this is the, the, the vendor specific thing. So this is for vendor one specific tasks. So the first thing I'm going to do um, with my specific vendor tasks, so I'm going to add a new field, and I'm going to go ahead and add a 999 field um, that says uh, uh, purchased from vendor one. I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, delete some fields. Um, I decided that for this particular vendor, um, they like to send me um, they like to send me uh, proxy new proxy neutral records, and I don't want them. Um, I want just the data that has my proxy in it. So I'm going to delete the A56 field. Um, I'm going to uh, look for, I'm going to keep records that, own, that have uh, myproxy.edu and I'm going to check the option that says um, remove if field does not match. So this way it's going to look for that and then delete anything that's not there that, that doesn't match that. So I'll delete that. Then I'm going to add my task list. So this is the list that I'm going to add. So that gets added to it. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new field um, that uh, adds my library as an, as an author for some odd reason. So, so I've got these. So this is my task. So now I've automated. So I have in this one statement, in this task, I have one, two, three um, individuals processes that are going to run. Within my task list, there are three additional options that are, that are there are three additional things that are going to run. So I have a total of six operations that are going to run as part of that particular task. Now I can assign that task to a key. So if I wanted to, I could set this task to shift F1 um, and then uh, be able to run it just as a keystroke. So I have my task. So my task is there. Uh, one of the things I'm going to do really quickly is I'm going to add um, another 856 so we can see that it deletes them. So I'm going to add one that has my proxy to it. So this way so I have, I've added my proxy here. So I've got one with the proxy and one without a proxy. So presumably, as long as I got this, that name right, then we should, we should have the same, same data there. 
Uh, look at our reports. We got 73 records. All right. So we're going to go ahead and run our task. So to run the task, um, I can either run the assigned key, so I could push Shift F1, or I can go over here to my currently available tasks, and I can select Vendor 1 because that's my Vendor 1 task. Uh, if I wanted to just run the tasks that are in, the, the operations in that library, I can run the library separately. But in this case, I want to run it all together. So I go ahead and I run it. Uh, the process gets run, and then when it's finished, it gives you a set of results that tells you what it was able to accomplish. So in this case, um, it added 73 fields, um, adding my, uh, my 999. Um, it deleted 90 fields where my proxy wasn't in the statement. It added 73 fields where it said it was automatically edited. The RDA process completed. 44 050s were deleted. And then the last thing it did was add 73 times the 70 10 to um, all of my records. So I have my I have my 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 report. I can print this report by using the print button. I can copy it and then paste it somewhere else if I want to keep it. If I close it and I go back and I can look at my records, I can see the data that's been done here. I can see the the changes that were made. Um, I can evaluate them. If I find that the records were run and they were run incorrectly. I made a mistake in my task. Um, I can go up here to edit, special undo, and it will um, uh, erase the task, although I'm not quite sure why it erased everything there. It was kind of weird. Um, it should have just erased the task. I wonder if I had something else going on. Uh, so let me try that one more time. It could have been that there was something else that I had sitting. So let's run it one more time. Do, 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 do. Okay, and let's go back. Yeah, so I must have had something that was uh, that, that dropped the reference. So I'll take a look at that. So, um, so I can undo it and go back and take away all of the task processes um, by using the special undo. That used to not be an option. It used to be once you ran a task, um, if you didn't like the results, you had to close your file and start again. Um, now the program tracks uh, what the last good known file pointer is. Uh, makes a copy of it, and so when your task is done, it can actually drop all the way back to the original um, file uh, form, the original form of the file before the task was run. Now, one of the things that um, the program will try and do is it'll try and protect you from yourself. Um, it is uh, if you, for example, had this task list and you referenced um, a task list that was running. Uh, so if I'm running vendor one, there's no reason I should never be able to run that task while it's running. Uh, because if I did, bad things happen. I get stuck into a loop and the program um, has problems. Uh, I know this because when I first put this together, um, I had some jokers that thought that they would try it to see if the program was actually checking to see um, if tasks were actually running and it caused bad things to happen. Uh, so the way it works now is if you run um, a task that references itself, um, it will go through the steps and then it will give you a warning telling you that you're trying to run a task that already is running right now and it will actually just not run it and it will continue on the process um, and finish the, the data elements that uh, it needed to complete. So let me go back to my task here. And if I need to delete a task, so in this case that one's one that I don't want there, I delete it and now we're good again. All right, so the task list gives you, give you um, a good deal of functionality uh, to, drop, drop it again, I'll figure out where that's going to drop from. Uh, a good deal of functionality to be able to uh, perform a, a multiplicity of edits. Now, a couple things about uh, how this works, because it's important to know. Um, did I mention it here? Yeah. Uh, so the tasks are essentially procedural. So it's not like um, all the tasks, it's not like each task is isolated from the other ones. Uh, as I finish an action which in the t within the task list, the, t the next action that follows it has the ability to interact with the data that was finished by the task preceding it. So that means if, say, I needed to clean up, um, a, let's say I'm cleaning up a call number and I need to do um, three things as part of that cleanup, 
uh, each one of those tasks would pick up where each one of those processes would pick up where the last one ended. So that way I can do things and actually run conditional um, processes based on the results of the procedure that happened above it in the task list. Uh, that also means you have to be careful. Um, so for example, um, when I was working at a, uh, at an as, at a, in an innovative library, um, when you export data from the system, one of the things that they, um, they give you uh, are a lot of 9xx fields and you can't load those back into the system. Um, so one of the things that used to be part of my normal task list was to delete um, the 9xx field. The thing was I had to remember um, that I needed some of that data before I deleted it to create um, the overlay code. I also needed to remember that the overlay code was a 9xx field. So um, it, was, it, would, it was really easy and I did a number of times at the very beginning when creating the tasks. I would create the overlay code and then delete it because the last step in the process was to delete the 9xx fields. Um, I had to eventually uh, modify the task list so that that um, process happened in multiple steps. That way um, I wasn't creating a field that then I was deleting as soon as I was done uh, creating it. All right, the last question um, that I got on the list uh, prior to, um, to starting this ha is a fairly simple question. Um, it has to do with, again, vendor records. Uh, vendors that like to send us data that um, have like all uppercase titles. Um, MarkEdit has the ability to do um, uh, case switching for you. Um, there are these things called edit shortcuts. They're tools that exist um, that don't quite fall under the category of what I would consider to be like an entirely um, a flexible global editing tool, uh, but it's a question that comes up enough that it made sense to provide a way to just kind of uh, uh, click from a menu to be able to run it um, and perform an action. So in this case, we have um, a data field. Um, I went ahead and just created a, a fake set of records um, as uppercase. <coughs> Excuse me. In this case, um, we'll see that the 245 subfield A is all in uppercase. So I can go to edit, um, edit shortcuts, change case, and I can choose to change it to lowercase, uppercase, which is already uppercase, so I don't need to do that, title case, initial case, or capital initial case. So we can just select which one we want um, and tell it the field that we're interested in working on and the subfield and have it process the data. And we can see then that the case gets adjusted. Um, so that now it's more um, visually appealing and no longer all in uppercase. And we can select from the different case types so it matches the, the, the output that you would like to see um, within your ILS system or based on uh, whatever the rules happen to be for the particular mark field. Um, so that's a pretty straightforward, um, straightforward one. Um, just to point out, uh, there are a couple other um, edit shortcuts. Uh, these are all case-based. There are these things called field edits. Um, you can, within the Mark Editor, without having to jump out. So earlier we looked at how you could use the Extract Selected Fields tool to find if, mark, uh, if a Mark uh, data file was missing a specific field. Um, you can also do that here. You can do Find Records Missing a Field, um, type in the field that you're looking for, and subfield if, you, if, if necessary. Um, and run that. And then we get a list of all of the records that don't have um, that particular field, subfield combination. And then we can jump to the records and, and look at them and evaluate them. This is actually really handy if you are, you've got a set of records. Um, for some reason, they don't have, one of them doesn't have a title. Um, you, might, you, know, you can actually quickly look and see why doesn't it have a title. Maybe there's a good reason for it not to have a title. But this way you can tell really quickly um, why there might be a record in your set um, that doesn't have a title or doesn't have subjects or doesn't have a call number. Um, and you can do this without having to leave MarkEdit um, or go through kind of that heavier tool, which is really for extracting subsets of data. <coughs> All 
All right, so those are the specific questions that were sent to me ahead of time. So we still have um, uh, about 35 minutes until um, we get to 1.30. There's a couple of things that there's, there's, there's a couple of things I'd really like to be able to, to, to show you at least one thing specifically, and that's uh, the validation, the headings validation. Um, if you have questions as we've been kind of going through um, the, as I've been talking and answering questions that were sent in early, if any of that's picked uh, any of that's kind of jogged a question that you have, uh, feel free to enter it into the uh, chat. And as soon as I finish talking about the validate headings tool, I will um, pick up the questions. Um, and if there are no questions, then I'll continue on and, and talk about the, the other things that I have on the slides. Okay. All right, so the validate heading tool is something that's brand new, and it's something that's still evolving. Um, one of the things that I've been spending a lot of time working on over the last year is how MarkEdit can be used to interact with linked data. Specifically, how can you embed linked data uh, information into your Mark records? Uh, to that end, uh, there's a, a linked data tool, which will actually allow you to embed um, subfield zeros into um, access control fields. Um, so into name or subject uh, authority records. Um, the subfield zero uses an actual fully realized URI, um, which is, I realize, um, not particularly kosher um, in the current um, Mark 21 rule set, uh, though I do know that the PCC is currently picking this up as a discussion point um, as to whether or not that, that, uh, into that, that set of rules should be uh, modified. Uh, specifically, if we start thinking about how we make um, our marked data available to um, people outside of the library community without requiring them to have any library domain uh, specific knowledge. Um, now, one of the benefits, though, of all of this work that I've been doing around linked data is that I have a set of tools now that allow me to do some really interesting things. And one of those interesting things is being able to validate headings and doing it on the fly. Um, so. One of the things that I spent some time working on, over, I've spent the time working on working on the last couple of weeks, um, prior to, after meeting with um, uh, our head of cataloging here at Oregon, at uh, Ohio State University, um, is uh, we use um, a vendor to do our authority control data. Every month we pull out um, new records. Um, I think that uh, I was told that we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of um, they extract something like 10 to, 10 to 20,000 records a month and they send those out to the vendor every month and then once a year they pull the entire database and send it out. And this is all in the name of authority control. And so one of the things that um, I started thinking about is this is a, a very long process to run, so I have some small record sets to do this on. Um, but since we can actually run um, through the linked data tool, since in the linked data tool I can tell you whether or not headings are valid, could I use that same concept, that same, um, that same logic, to be able to generate for um, users a report that would actually let them see um, which headings are valid and which headings aren't? and which headings are variants and which headings aren't and be able to actually isolate from a much larger set of data just the records that need to have um, headings processed on. Um, and this is actually a fairly easy thing to do. Uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm limiting the tool primarily to working with the Library of Congress's authority tool. Um, I realize that the Library of Congress traditionally doesn't like people to do an awful lot of data requests on their system. Um, and this was a concern uh, in putting this together. Um, I spent a good deal of time talking to them. They are aware that this tool exists um, and are watching uh, how it impacts uh, the id.loc.gov, the linked data tool set that they have. Um, they actually provided um, a method to interact with the resource in a way that's much easier on their systems uh, so that MarkEdit could work with it. Um, so as, as of this point, they're good to go and, and looking for, um, completely good for people to uh, play with. Um, and so we're, we're ready to, uh, to give it a go. So what I want to do is I want to show you how this works really quickly. And I've seen that there's a question, so I'll pick that up as soon as, uh, as, soon as we do this. So um, the headings tool is really designed um, to let you see what your, to give you an idea of what your headings look like. So it's a very straightforward interface. Um, you basically uh, give it a source file. So you run this right now within the Mark Editor. 
um, you tell it what you want to authorize. So 1xx, 7xx fields, 6xx. Whether you want to authorize just the subfield A in the 6xx fields, which makes a difference. Those free floating fields um, aren't always valid all the way through. Um, they're not validated all the way, all the way through um, sometimes, so it's easier to do the subfield A. Um, and then MarkEdit uses a local cache, um, which is good for a month. Uh, that allows the process to happen faster and again makes it a little bit easier on the Library of Congress's systems. So let me show you how this works. So if I go into my tool here, I have a quick set of data. Um, these are records from OCLC WorldShare. Um, so some of most of these should be fairly good. Um, I will go to reports. There's this tool called validate headings. If I look at the tool here, um, I can go and check delete local cache. I'm going to process just the subfield A and tell it to process. We can then watch um, the records process. It will be faster or slower. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, keep talking while it's, it's working here. There are only 12 records, so it's not going to take that long for it to, get to go. Uh, this is actually one of the problems with working with, say, for example, a linked data hub. Um, uh, the, the data only comes back as fast as, say, the Library of Congress is answering questions. So that means later in the day is faster than earlier in the day. This is a kind of process, though, that doesn't have to be particularly fast because you can run it and then leave and then come back and get the results. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, look at the questions now while this is running, and then this will finish in a second, and then we'll go back. So I have, um, I have two questions that have been asked. One is, um, uh, can we extract records from a file based on record numbers? Uh, whether or not we generate them and put them in a separate file. Um, and I think I understand that question. Um, so so the answer to that question actually is yes. Um, let me show you how while this thing finishes the last record in its, in its set here. Um, if I was going to do that, um, I'm going to make an assumption um, that uh, when you're saying can we extract records from a file based on record numbers that you have the record numbers I'm assuming. Um, if you have a list of record numbers um, say like in an Excel sheet or, or in a file I see your, the, some clarification. Um, let's see what the clarification says. Uh, okay while that's happening I'll, I'll show you this. So the validate headings is finished. So um, here's the, 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 the report that we get. We get validation reports. Um, process took 1.2 minutes to finish. Took about a second point three for MarkEdit to get a response from LC. There are two records with invalid headings. We can see what those two records are. And when I'm done, I can copy this report. Um, and I can actually extract those records. So if I click this button, it'll pull those two records out. And so now I have just those two records in this list. And so now I can work with those records, do something with those records, whatever I wanted to do with them. Um, all right, so let me go back to the, the question as it was asked. Okay, so some clarification. So you mean with the numbers that MarkEdit would have generated. So you're talking about if I use the, uh, the comments, can you extract records based on um, those record numbers? Um, yes, you can, um, but not using the comments themselves. Um, unfortunately, uh, the comments are hidden um, from the tool, so it really doesn't see those. Um, if you um, went through, like let's say you went through and you were looking at the file and you found the numbers that you were looking for, looking for. so let's say you generated, you marked the comments on the records and as you went through you seen that, you know, I actually need to have these particular records from there. Um, then I could use the extract records tool and use the range function. So, um, so you would have to do something like, uh, let me grab my, uh, so let's say you would have to do something like this where you have your tools, um, you generate your, um, your marks um, so that they're there. Um, I know I want records, you know, four and six. You know, I'm looking through these. I've jumped around. I found the records I want. I write down the numbers. Then I could use um, use this tool here. Oops. Just a second.
use this tool here um, to then extract those records. If I had my record numbers, I could do R and then 0, um, 10 through 13, 56, 100. Um, I don't know if there are actually that many records in this list. And so then I can select those records and extract them. Um, if you actually want to extract the records, though, um, based on the comments that are generated, it, it doesn't do that. Um, the, the comments are seen only in the find and replace function, and that's just because the find and replace function sees all the data. Otherwise, the comments really are comments, and they're, and they're hidden from the application. Uh, the second question that was asked um, was, is there a way to, uh, to find records with the same ISBN uh, within a record set? Um, let me see if how, let me see. Uh, so you're looking for whether, you're looking for um, duplicate data. Uh, so it, uh, let me see. So, so if you're asking, um, can you find out if there are duplicate records within, the t within a record set? So um, by ISBN. So say I have, um, 50 records and um, I know that uh, four of them are duplicates, um, I mean, so there's clear, then yes, that, that's actually something that's fairly easy to do. Um, Mark Edit has a deduping tool under record deduplication and you can actually set the dupe point as the ISBN and it will look at all the ISBNs within your records. Um, and you can have it print, uh, remove the duplicate items or print just the unique items. So let's say, and what that means is, um, if I had duplicates um, and I was matching on the ISBN, then it would remove the extra file. And I would just get, if I had 50 records, three of them were duplicates, I would end up with a file of 47 records. If I had, uh, if I wanted just the unique records, um, then I know there are three duplicates, then it would print out, um, and I had 50 records, then it would print out um, uh, 44 records because those duplicates, both the, 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 the three that were duplicates would be six records that would be pulled out, and it would just print the unique ones that didn't have any duplicates. Um, and I can use this save duplicate um, option so that I can save um, any of the, the data that um, gets pulled out as part of this process into another file so I can look at those separately. <clears throat> if you're asking specifically about can I look in um, a record and find the ones where maybe the ISBNs within the same record are duplicated, so <clears throat> I have, let's say I have three records and one of those records has um, two O two O fields and they're identical. Um, there's n not really a good way of doing that. Um, there is a tool in Mark Edit though that would allow you to delete it. So you probably don't want those duplicate elements there. That's probably why you're looking for them. Um, if you use the add delete tool and enter in O two O and just tell it to remove duplicate data, Mark Edit evaluates that entire field and will only delete it if it's duplicated. So if I had two ISBN set, two, two ISBN um, records, two ISBN fields that were exactly the same, um, the program would delete one of them. So you would be left with just one within the record, which um, I'm guessing, uh, based on the question, that's probably what the end result would end up being. Um, so. Um, I'm not sure if that completely answers your question. Um, kind of two different, I guess that's two different approaches for two different problems. Um, so hopefully that, hopefully one of those um, covered what you were asking. Okay, great. All right, so the que sec next question is, are we able to change a code in the LDR? Um, yes, you can. Um, Mark Edit actually can change, you have uh, multiple options for changing LD data in, in any control field. Um, so two ways to do it. 
um, you could either do um, it through the replace function. So let's say I wanted to change uh, this value here. So the what? Uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the fifth 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 byte. So I'm going to change the fifth byte from a C to a W. Um, I can do that in a regular expression here. LDR uh, 2 and then I'm going to go five bytes in and I'm going to chain and I'm looking for a C and I'm going to go um, looking for a C and then dot all um, and I'm going to go dollar sign one uh, W dollar sign uh, three. Um, so that should uh, replace, um, yeah, so there we go. So that let me do um, the LDR, and I could do control fields that way. Uh, there's actually a much easier way to do that, though. Uh, if you go to the edit subfield function and you type in um, uh, LDR, you'll see that the, the value here changes from subfield uh, to position. Um, which is imp an important designation here because now I'm entering position. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my position. It starts at 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I'm looking at position 5. I'm doing one value, so it's 5 uh, colon 1. Data I'm looking for is a C. I'm turning it into a W. I replace that text. And again, you see that the text is replaced. Um, the way that the edit subfield tool works Anytime you enter a field number that's below 10, it automatically shifts um, into a mode where it's looking for control data. It's assuming that you're working with um, data that's in a, um, it's not variable field data, but it's fixed field data. And so position matters. Um, and so you have the option there now um, to edit data by position. Um, you give it the, the position you're looking for, a colon, and then the number of bytes you're going to change. And you can search for those either as an in string like we did in the example, or you can search for them using regular expressions. So you get uh, a lot of um, uh, capability to do some fairly complicated um, adjustments on your records in those uh, control field values. <clears throat> so hopefully that answered that question. Um, so while so that so that there's no other questions right now, so I'm going to go ahead and step through um, the slides to the next um, uh, thing that I wanted to make sure I hit. Um, and if another question comes through, I'll, I'll take it. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out was a change to the replacement function. You might have seen it as we've been going through this um, some of these slides. Um, the replacement function about a month or two ago um, had was expanded to give you the ability to do conditional replacements. So one of the things that was really hard to do in MarkEdit before was to say, for example, um, I want to um, add, I want to change, let's say I'm going to change the title, but only if the call number is a certain value. So that's, um, that's challenging because the replacement function is capturing the data in the title so that you can change it. Um, so it's looking for title data, but you actually don't want that to happen unless something else happens first. Um, so the program has the ability to do conditional replacements, either using regular expressions or not. Um, these are used here. Um, you'll see in the slide here, whoops, um, there is uh, an extra option in the regular expression or in the find box that says perform find replace if. Um, so let me show you how that works really quickly. All right, so let me do that. All right, so here we have our file. And what I'm going to do with this file, uh, and actually I'm going to grab one of um, your guys' files real quick. All right, so what I'm going to do with this file is we can see in the 050 um, that there's a QP. So I'm going to only do, um, I'm only going to run a fun I'm only going to run a replacement if the call number um, is a QP. Um, uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my replacement function and I'm going to enter in um, the, the actual replacement that I want to do. And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some data to the 245. So that's, that's what I want to eventually do. So I'm going to say equals uh, 245 for 
and then um, I'm going to pick up the subfield A, and then I'm going to grab everything that follows it. Then I'm going to tell it what I want to do here is I'm going to go ahead and add some prepended data. So I'll go one, and then uh, this is added, and then two. Um, so now I've got this, but I only want to run this if um, my data here has uh, that QP in it. So I'm going to check this button that says perform if. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a regular expression here too. And so I'm going to tell it that I'm actually looking for um, the 050 and that 050, um, the subfield A, needs to start with a Q and let's say um, we actually aren't going to do it just on QP. We're going to do it on anything that's from um, uh, O to Z. So anything that's in a uh, Q O to Z is going to get picked up. And then I'm going to check use regular expressions. So this use the bottom use regular expression option applies to the find what and replace option. The drop down box here applies to what's going on in the conditional replacement box. I'm going to go ahead and run that replacement. Two modifications were made. And when I go back and look at them, um, I can see here in my first one, which had uh, the, the Q, where did the Q go? There it is, QP. We can see that that was added here. This is added. Let's see what the other one was, because I'm not sure where that other one came from. So that was in record 17. So we jump to record 17. Again, there was another QP there. And so what I did through my replacement function is the very first thing the program does when it runs that perform um, replacement if is it does an initial uh, filter. It does a, a search against that value. And if that value comes up as true um, in however you're trying to evaluate it, whether it's you're looking for data or looking for data that doesn't exist, um, once that evaluates as, as being OK, then the second part of the replacement happens, which can be on a completely different set of data. So in this case, we were looking at the 050, but the data we were actually editing was the 245. And so that's where this particular function um, provides a lot of flexibility that wasn't there before. This used to be something that would have to be done in multiple processes. Um, the old method would be you would extract a subset of data that just had that information, and then I would do my replacement. Now I can do it um, using this particular tool. Um, now the caveat is it's obviously limited to um, the first conditional. You get, you get one. Um, there's been, you know, uh, there's been requests, can I make this something where users could keep adding more and more and more conditionals to? So you could say run multiple queries um, before you actually did your find and replace. Um, it's actually not that difficult to add to the program. The problem is that um, the, the performance gets really poor, um, especially as you get to really large files, um, because you're essentially pre-screening the file every time you run one of these conditionals. Um, and so um, at this point, I'm leaving it at a single value. Um, I might try and exp I might expand it later, but, but that's something that I, I believe was, is new from uh, the last time I was um, at, out in um, Albany and, and Syracuse, and I wanted to make sure that I uh, brought that up just in case it was. Um, so I haven't seen any other, uh, any other questions come in, so I'm going to go ahead and, and talk about um, one other change that's been made uh, to the program. Um, one of the, the problems that I see come up often um, are people who, have, who get data from vendors, and the vendor data will break. So when they run it through the mark breaker into the mark edit editor, it'll, it'll break. So it'll tell you how many records are there. Um, but the challenge is when it gets to the mark editor, the file format's incorrect. And it's really, really hard to see. Um, because a lot of times, maybe what's happened is there's been a null byte that's been embedded. So a, um, a byte that's 0, 0. Um, when mark edit tries to recompile that, it's going to throw an error. And what you're going to get is you're going to get an, a message that says 0 records compiled. And it's going to be really confusing. Um, so one of the things that I, I tried to do this time around, um, Mark Edit's Mark Validator runs differently depending on whether you're it used to run differently depending on if you were in the Mark Editor or outside of the Mark Editor. If you were in the Mark Editor, um, you could run a process.
process to identify invalid records that looked for records that couldn't be compiled back into MARC. And it looked for a lot of different kinds of structural errors. And one of those errors that it was looking for was those kind of null byte values. Um, unfortunately, over the last week, I encountered a file that um, uh, someone from the community had sent me that was over 400 megabytes. And the problem is when the mnemonic file format is, is, is messed up, the paging mode doesn't work. And so MarkEdit will fall back to just loading all the data into the screen. And loading 400 megabytes into the Mark Edit window, it works on my machine, but it doesn't work on the individual user's machine because at that point, your virtual memory becomes very um, important. And I have a lot of it. Um, so what I could do is I could open it up into the Mark Editor, and then I could run the validate tool, and I could tell them what was wrong. But they weren't able to do that themselves. So what I did is I changed the way the validator works. So now the tool actually look works um, differently, not by whether or not you're in the Mark Editor or and outside the Mark Editor, but works differently based on the type of file you're working with. So if you're working with a .mrc file or a .dot uh, .mrc file, so a binary Mark file, then when you're running the tool, um, the identify the validate records, which works the same whether it's a .mrk or a .mrc file, is working through that rules file that you provided to see if your data conforms to Mark 21. When you're working with a Mark file, a .mrc file, and you look to identify invalid records, what the tool is looking for is it's looking for those records that when you break them would cause the problem, would cause the program to fall out of the strict uh, Mark breaking algorithm. So when you break a record um, that's bad, um, using the mark tool set and that number of records had, that's been broken turns red. Essentially anything that would cause that to turn red, that's what it's looking for. And the remove invalid records will remove those records from the binary mark file for you to work with later. Now when working with a .mrk file, the opposite, it does the, the same thing, but only it's working on .mrk files. And so the validation is different. When you're asking it to find invalid records, identify invalid records, it's looking for records that when you try and compile them back to MARC, won't work. So it's looking for structural errors, it's looking for records that have hanging subfields. So for example, um, uh, dollar sign, dollar sign $B, that's a, a type of um, subfield encoding that would cause records to be invalid and cause your ILS issues. Um, so it's looking for some common problems, but it's also looking for structural errors that would cause the, the, the program to be unable to compile a specific record. And then it'll report those back. Um, and it can do that now outside of the Mark Validator, which is handy. Um, the remove invalid records is new. The program, when running within the Mark Editor or anywhere, never used to be able to do that. Now the tool will actually give you the option so that you can remove those records that are causing, that are making it so that your mnemonic file can't be compiled back to Mark. So in the case of the user um, over the last week, they had 100,000 records in a file that was almost 400 megabytes. Um, there were approximately 12 records that were bad. Um, and these were records that had um, null bytes encoded into them. It was um, impossible for them to get to that data because their system didn't have enough virtual memory to load them into the Mark Editor to run this tool. With these changes now, um, they can run this themselves. They can run the, the validation tool, um, the invalid record invalidation tool outside of the Mark Editor, identify the problem records, and then remove them um, on their own. So they were able to very quickly, with those changes, um, collect back the records that were problems and then be able to uh, um, work with the ones that were good. So that, that I thought was a, 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 a nice enhancement. Um, that I like to that I like to make you guys a bit aware of, since uh, you know vendor records have all kinds of problems sometimes. Um, the last thing I'll mention um, is something that uh, uh, is new to the program. This was requested by OCLC. Um, the uh, uh, number of OCLC. Um, uh, reps, they work with MarkEdit, and um, when they're working with new libraries, small libraries, um, occasionally what they have is um, those libraries are looking to get their WorldCat records. Um, OCLC, um, uh, 
they were able to, the, the, these institutions will say have um, a list of OCLC record numbers. Um, and they want to be able to download those records in mass. OCLC doesn't have an, a process for that. Uh, so they asked if I could provide one in MarkEdit. Uh, using the Met OCLC metadata API, as long as you have a, a file that has OCLC record numbers in it, you can use this tool. It's found um, on the main screen under Tools. There is OCLC Operations and then the OCLC record downloader. You point it at your records. Um, so I actually have a, an OCLC file that has four records in it um, where I'm going to save it. And then just go ahead and download it. And as long as you have um, a metadata API uh, that's valid, the program can go ahead and pick them up. Uh, now, um, I realize that uh, the metadata API has some usage restrictions around um, the kind of things that, that they uh, say that you're allowed to do with it. Um, and it seems to me that this kind of thing might not fall under the category of stuff that um, uh, they particularly encourage. Um, but since this was um, a function that OCLC had asked um, to be created specifically for some people that they were working with, um, it's there. Um, it's available for use. Um, you just want to make sure that uh, as you're downloading records, you follow whatever um, uh, requirements OCLC has put in place for the metadata API. I think the record limits, they're fairly high. Um, they're in the tens or fifteen thousands, maybe higher than that. Um, for many small libraries that they were, they were pointing users to use this, um, they fall within, they easily fall within that grouping. Um, for some larger libraries that might be part of this call, if you try and use this tool, you, you do need to be aware that if you try and download, say, a million records, there will come a point where it'll tell you that it's done. Um, and you'll be done for a while. I think it's a 24-hour timeout before you're allowed to uh, pick up the records again. So um, we are coming up on, uh, on 1.30. Looks like we're about three minutes um, from uh, what I believe is the, the end of the session. Um, so I will uh, give uh, folks one last opportunity. Um, if there are any uh, kind of outstanding burning questions, uh, if there's not, you are free uh, to contact me directly. Um, my uh, contact information is on the slides that are available for download. Um, uh, you guys will have these uh, recordings um, that you can refer back to. Uh, so if the recordings happen to um, spur on other questions, feel free to ask them. Uh, I would encourage uh, anybody who's not on the Mark Edit list um, who plans on using the application, um, especially if they're interested in working with um, regular expressions and are um, in the process of learning them, uh, to join the listserv and use that resource because the uh, the listserv is a, is a very good resource for, for that kind of information and, and they really like to, to help with that. Um, so um, I guess that's, uh, that's what I have to say. So if Carolyn wants to pick it back up, if there's anything she wanted to say in closing, I'll, I'll release the screen back um, to her. Yes, um, thank you so much, Terry. On behalf of everyone here at the Three R's, uh, we really appreciate your time. And um, I'm just going to share something real quick here in chat. Uh, this, the slides that you put together are now up online, and uh, as soon as we get the recording together, we'll post that on there as well. Um, so if everyone just wants to give Terry a round of applause, I see many of you are thanking him. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's been a great webinar. And uh, we have some more contact information here on this slide, too, if anyone has any other questions. Also, uh, one last thing before we go. I have one. Uh, there's, Matthew from NYTRs will be sending you all an evaluation. Uh, we really appreciate it if you can fill it out. I'm also going to give you the link to it here, so you'll be getting it both ways. We uh, use those to create all of our upcoming programming, so it's very helpful. So. Again, Terry, thank you very much, and thank you all for being here today. Thank you much.